Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Hello and welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because we all know ideas are easy, but implementation can be pretty difficult. Today, our guest is Severin Sorensen, and I'd like to welcome you to the podcast, Sev. Great. Uh, thanks. Happy to be here. What I'd like to do is talk about the AI series called The AI Whisperer. It's a three-book series you put together. And if you could bring us up to date, what is an AI whisperer? An AI whisperer, like a horse whisperer, is an individual who has the ability to prompt with such nuance that it appears to get better results from AI. So essentially, it's a prompt engineer, but a wise prompt engineer. Okay. And what brought you to writing a three-book series on that topic? I had a profound experience with ChatGPT back uh, a year ago on December 11th of 2022. And in that experience, I was so impacted by what I learned. I had three thoughts that came to me. The first mm -hmm. was, wow. The second was extreme humility. I'm like, I know nothing. I mean, I, mm -hmm. it, it knows everything, or at least it appeared to. And uh, what I had always been a knowledge worker. And I'm like, if it knows all this, I and mean, that's just very humbling. But I thought, oh, well, that's cool. What could I explore? And then a couple of hours later, I'm like, wow, this is so powerful. In all that I do to try to promote it, I also need to promote ethical use of it, guardrails, safety, and so on as well. So that, mm -hmm. that was my first start. Then I began um, evangelizing, telling everybody, have you seen this? Have you used it? And I can recall, I, I do quite a bit of public speaking and working with uh, business owners and CEO groups. And they would say, oh, we really liked your topic, but we waste those minutes on AI. It's not going to happen in my industry. And I'm like, what? You guys need to wake up. Look at mm -hmm. it. It's, it's coming. So I actually wrote the first book as an answer to the question, it's not going to happen in my industry. Well, in the first book, The AI Whisper, I uh, have got a copy of it here. So mm -hmm. in this particular book, it goes over 50 different ways that AI can be used in one business. Uh, and everything from creating content to writing, to helping with spreadsheets, uh, PowerPoints, everything. And that really was the beginning. Mm -hmm. So how did you conceptualize what should what content should be in the book and how it can be made very easily easy for a small, medium-sized business or a large business to start implementing the concepts and understanding AI. Okay, thanks. You know, it's interesting. Each time in life, we might find ourselves in a position, and I felt kind of uniquely qualified to write a book about business since I've been a business coach for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Used to hearing the questions that they were having, I thought, well, how could you use this to answer those questions? <clears throat> So in my background, I've been executive coaching uh, for a number of years. I have logged over 8,000 hours of executive coaching. And in all of the coaching, even though it's 8,000 hours, it seems like it boils down to the same questions. Yeah. I have a subdirectory of 133 <laughs> topics. How do I fire? How do I hire? How do I buy? How do I sell? How do I create an MVP? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, all of these different questions. So I, I sat down and said, of these, which ones are the ones that would have the most utility? Then that seed started research and went out researching questions had, and then decided, well, what are 50 that most people could use? And we created uh, 50 different uh, case studies for that. Okay. So at its core, AI very much is simply the art of asking questions. So oh, getting results, that's for sure. That's right. So, so I sit down, let's say I'm a beginner. I look at your book and I say, I have some needs in my business. How can I actually use the book to start getting answers and solutions for the problems that I'm experiencing? Oh, thank you. Great question. So the book is uh, brought out in the following way. At the beginning is the introduction to asking questions, the introduction to how you prompt and then how to get better prompts. 
I have in there material, say, from Bloom's Taxonomy of Questions that helps you understand the root of a question and the seed of different answers. I would recommend anybody wanting to get into AI, buy the book and read the first three chapters in its entirety. Then after that, I have 50 business use cases for it. Pick and choose, like a recipe book or a toolkit, which ones would be most important for your business at this time. And then from that, you could go forward. So that's how I, I would use the book. And I encourage others to do it as well. Okay, so I've obviously read the books. I've applied it, put it to a test. I had some questions for social media management because that's, uh, I believe, use case number 10 for you. I actually went through and I entered some of the prompts and it is amazing how it is very directive and it works extremely well. And then I believe you have footnotes and books and references that you can go to to investigate further. And I find that extremely valuable because it's almost like you're sitting in the room with me and I can create a dialogue and a conversation through your book with you, Sev, which is obviously really important. It's a handholding for somebody that doesn't know how to manage and maneuver or navigate through the AI complexities. So what kind of success stories have you had? What have people told you about the book, how it's helped them? What are some real life examples of, of its application? Well, it's been pretty amazing. You know, you can be involved in creating some work, but where it goes, it has its own life. I had one person show me their copy of the book. They said, I've been in your book now for three weeks, and it was the most dog-eared copy of the book. It was Mm -hmm. The book itself is thin. It's probably only half an inch thick. Her copy was three inches thick because she had bent over all the pages. She goes, I've spent a day on each one of these getting deeper and deeper and deeper because I have to buy another copy now because I have shredded uh, this book. Uh-huh. But she said the uh, the detail that goes to, and like you say, you know, once you think you've gone where you are, you can go to those websites that are listed to find more information to add more nuance to your prompt. So that's one person. I've had another person say, I went through this. I was interested in standard operating procedures. I followed the procedure. I wrote an entire manual for my company in, you know, an hour's time looking at these different topics. So Mm -hmm. lots of uh, great different uh, examples. So some of the other examples of building a blog post that can help you do that. You're instructed in that area, writing press releases writing frequently asked questions for your website, product descriptions, research assistance. There's many different areas, over 50, as you said, that you can actually apply this through your book. How do you see that impacting small, medium businesses over the next two, three years? Oh, it's huge. Yeah, I wrote this book because in a way I was tired of just the large companies having access with their big budgets. And I wanted small to medium sized businesses to not only wake up, but have the tools to immediately go in. So a company could take this first. And I've had a company did the following. They took the book and they gave a copy to each of the direct reports uh, around all the different function wheels, if you will, the company. Then each one be- was required each week to pick another category in the book to go deeper, deeper. Because what you're learning is a language. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm holding up here a pen. Now, a pen is, you know, it could be a pencil, all right, but just a writing instrument. But this instrument does nothing unless you use it. Now, with a pen, you know, great authors have written wonderful books with a pen and artists can draw things. But unless you learn to use the pen, it does nothing. And this book is about how, in a very granular way, to use it in the business domain for all of these different tasks. So it really is 101, if you will. If you think about college or a high school textbook, it's a book to get you into this. It won't make you expert. It will definitely get you to an intermediate level, though, rather quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, along with you, around a year ago, discovered... AI, chat, GPT in particular, and it's mind-blowing on what you can do and how sophisticated it can be in many respects. But then you took it a step further by writing your second book, and that has to do more with pictures, images, media, emojis, etc. Tell us a little bit about how you were led. What prompted you to write that second book in the series? Well, that's great. All right. So my second book, uh, it's got this one has a blue Mm -hmm. cover. It's Mm -hmm. all about art. And what's interesting is 
as I finished writing the first one, I said, I need to have a cover for the book. I said, I can't write an AI book without having AI help me with the artwork. Mm -hmm. And so I began using different models. I'd use the original Dolly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I had used the original Dolly, and I was not impressed with the imagery. I'd heard about Mid Journey. I dove in. I was immediately taken by how wonderful the images were, but how creative with the prompting. And so I created an image for that, and I put it on the book. And I began exploring with these images. But while I was training a company using the Yellow Book, we had a corporate retreat and the president was there. We were in his home with all of his kids. Ex. Somebody said, I love all the work and the words of AI, but how did you do the cover on this book? And I said, mm -hmm. oh, that was mid journey. And they go, where's the book for that? That's what I want to do. And we spent about an hour showing them how to use it. And they said, I want my entire house filled with art <laughs> like I create there. In fact, I think it demonstrates how new businesses will be created. This person said, I want to create my own art and I want to put them, print them out on surfaces and post them all over my house. Well, that business would be a, a brand new business of thinking of how to create this art for people that, you know, formerly we've done photos, but now it could be almost anything. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty exciting. So having thought, okay, you want to do this, what would a measure book? Now that book took a long time. I followed the same practice I did with the first one, 50 different business cases for business. I did 50 business cases for art. And in that one, it goes over everything from how to create the imagery for proposals for blog posts for a uh, trade show booth you know any type of thing that you would use imagery even a car wrap it gives an example of how to do that so it took me using ai uh, and a lot of research it took me about a month to write that book but it's mm -hmm. very impressive and it really will take somebody with no experience all the way through turn this click this button go to this file click this and help you create great art well, I'm going through and reviewing that second book, what occurred to me over and over was that you're actually marrying art and culture in many respects of your business from a personal standpoint with the analytical side of actually book one. How do I use the prompts? How do I ask better questions? How do I get deeper and deeper into more of a creative aspect? So you're really marrying the creativity and the process confinement or rules of running an, a good business in many respects so then you go to the third book and it's wizard words and that's kind of like the now we're going deeper and deeper into the world of ai and how i apply it to my business tell me a little bit about that third book if you could all right. So the third book, uh, if you were to see it, has a green cover on it. And I've got a picture of a wizard. And by the way, it should look suspiciously like me here. In order that I didn't copyright, uh, have any copyright violation, I fused my own image into this. I could say, no, it's pretty original, but uh, I don't have hair, but in, in the image. I All right. So the book was put together the following way. I had people, as I was training businesses, I'd have people come up and start taking pictures of the screen. I'm like, while well, I was prompting, I'm like, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're prompting, but we're not getting the results you're doing. It's like you have your own language. You're very descriptive. You're directive. You're, you're doing something. We want to capture those words because we want to get the same result. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And, and it just kept happening over and over. And so as I was listening, I'm like, well, is this a thing? And so one day, and it's funny, I, my relationship with AI is much like you would con have a conversation with a person. I took a time out on a project and I said to AI, in this case, chat GPT, okay, am I making this up or is it the case that using certain words and language gives you better prompts? In fact, is there such a thing as a wizard word or a keyword or a semantic token that gets better? And we basically had this back and forth conversation in which I learned in the process, yes, the words you use matter. And some of the words matter a lot. And so I began to explore, well, what are these words? And came up with well over 100 that were business focused. And I thought, well, what would be the 100 that would be the most appropriate for most businesses? And then you could do specialized sets later. And so I created that wizard words for that. I have, uh, I don't know if I'm able to share an image with you here, but I could describe an image for you mm -hmm. uh, that I think is just uh, pretty fantastic having to do with what words mean. So am I able to share an image with you, by the way? 
Uh, no, I don't believe we can okay. at this point. Well, I'll just, I'll just describe mm -hmm. one for you. Okay. So in my Twitter feed of Sev Sorensen, I was trying to describe to people how words are so powerful. So I gave an example of a table. And, and I had actually AI draw a table. This actually was in the drawing that uh, Dolly 3 did really well. Ten different use cases for table just inside of AI. So, for example, and when you say table, it could be like a table you know, like a desk, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it could also be data reference table, HTMI table, uh, ASCII table, R table, Python, periodic table, table of contents, so many different, mm -hmm. well, 10 different ways that mm -hmm. the word table alone and how you use the word table can really cause magic to happen with your prompting. So for example, in your next prompt, once you have a bunch of data together, just write these words, place into a table this data and order it by, and then give what you want for the columns, and then watch it actually take the, the data you have and restructure it into a table you could actually copy and paste and put right into Excel. This book itself is a hundred of those words that each have something embedded in the definition of the word that causes AI to do something special with it. That's great. <laughs> That's great. So, how did AI come up with the term? token and what does that mean for individuals who are new to the world of ai oh that's interesting so ai was introduced to the concept of token as a measurement for all of the data that was being parsed a token could be a word it could be a symbol it could be a number it could be a combination of words and how they pay on the back end if you were to use an api for let's say one of the models they would charge you for content that they're just parsing out as tokens mm -hmm. so every so many characters equals one token mm -hmm. and so the idea in terms of semantic tokens ai doesn't actually memorize it's not like you have this body and it's sitting there in reserve it's actually learning from this uh, from the tokens. And so in terms of the words that I have in, in the wizard words, they're only wizardly in the definitions that are there. It's not like there's a base program underneath it that causes it to do something. But there are some words that are nested that have dual meanings. For example, the word create. If you use, I'll go back to table. If you use the word create table, it drops you into a black framed uh what I call R squared or like a Python table. But if you use the words place into a table, it drops you into a white screen one. Um, if you used the words matplotlib, it'll actually go out and reference a dictionary of math that will allow you to graph things. So there are lots of these little key words that when nested with a prompt helps the data do something. Okay, so I played around a little bit, got to the third book. Wizard words, you have a hundred listed there. So it occurred to me that this was almost like paint by numbers. It was so easy. I could literally pick out seven key words and I, I wrote a document or it created a document for me that is literally beyond my imagination in many respects. I want to give you an idea here, an example. I said I wanted to brainstorm. That was the first keyword. And I wanted to analyze the second keyword. I used case studies, the third keyword, that would for evaluate my business problem, five, fifth keyword, through scholarly research, and the last keyword, and prioritize activities that I should take and put in place. The small That's manual basketball. that they came up with was unbelievable. So I looked at this, and it almost is a paint-by-number. I can pick out these keywords create a logic string, if you will, or sequence, and then see how AI starts creating very easily a response, a booklet. I mean, it's all dependent upon and limited by your imagination. It's fascinating how you've put this together and how easy it is to use the tools. So I have to give you my compliments on that. Oh, thank you. So let's take it one step further if we can now. At GuideWise, we believe there's three things that every organization has to be able to focus on. IQ or the hard skills of doing a job. The second part is um, emotional intelligence. How do I get along with people? And how do I self-manage and become self-aware of myself? 
And the third area is I need feedback, outside feedback, so that I can develop my skills in these areas. You and I have had an interesting conversation about how you are finding that EQ or emotional intelligence gets a little deeper in bringing back the prompts. So we start initially with your first book. You give us some prompts to do. That's the hard skills, IQ in many respects. We get to the second book of art and culture. Now we're bringing in a little bit more of that EQ emphasis. Third book, I've got many more keywords, wizard words, tokens that I can use so I can communicate better. Now it's time to bring in the EQ and the humanizing aspects, if you will, of this technology and how it can help you build your business. Talk to me a little bit about the research findings and the applications for EQ or emotional intelligence and the importance of that in developing your business. Well, thank you. That's quite a question. Let's see if I can unpack it here. Okay. Let's start first. Many people who have used AI have had the experience where initially, and I'm sure it's going to improve, but initially it was like AI acted like an emotional six-year-old with an Einstein's brain. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was incredibly bright, but you could tick it off, or it might appear to be lazy or push back and so on. And I thought this was really curious, and I began to study and, and research this and ask different questions to AI. And I said, is I go, when I am more creative, playful, directive, uh, but when I am wondering, I seem to get better results than when I'm nasty, brutish, and short. Mm -hmm. And I asked that question to the AI. I said, well, you probably do get better responses, but not for the reasons that you think. AI is not a person, but AI does understand emotion. And when you are creative, directive, wondering, if you will, with questions, you are probably more descriptive and it knows what to do with that. But when you're nasty, brutish, and short, when you provide nowhere for it to go, it doesn't know what to do with that. And you might get uh, less responses. Now, what's really weird about it, AI is designed to think like a brain. Therefore, it has some of the problems of the brain. All mm -hmm. right, for example, memory retention. You might have heard in a class or a structure, if you were ever thinking about uh, speaking and putting a course together, you tell them at the front what you want them to do, mm -hmm. and then you teach them, and then you tell them at the end again what you've done. Some of the research in this is just so odd. There was a scholarly article that was put out called Missing the Middle. And AI, with its function that's designed just like a brain, if you will, is actually missing the middle. It's remembering what you prompt at the beginning and at the end, but it's kind of dropping out in the middle. Mm -hmm. This has huge implications if you think you're going to load up a large document. It's like a student reading the chapter summary and reading the conclusion and saying, well, I've read the book. Here's my first attempt at a report. You've got to watch that, and you've got to basically chunk it down into the pieces to make sure it considers all of the things. So that's one. Another thing that's kind of interesting, really bizarre uh, article that came out, they were using a variety of different AI models. They were prompting which model gets the best results uh, and which prompt gets the best results from a particular model. And would you believe it? And this is really weird. The prompt that got the best results was this. Take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step. Wow. wow. Now, that's stunning. Computers don't breathe, right? but what is it about this? And recently, ChatGPT, OpenAI, uh, has actually come out to say, slowing AI down, having it work in chunks, just like I really like the prompt that you put together, right? Where you basically said, analyze, and you move mm -hmm. to another prompt, and you move right. to another prompt. Each time we take it and we spin and we have it do something else, it's getting uh, more data. So for example, here's a prompt that I frequently use that gets some results. It'd be fairly similar to something you've done. You think of a topic, and then I uh, say you have a topic, you paste in some material. The first thing I'll say is take in the details. Then I'll put a comma, ponder, comma, analyze, comma, compare, contrast, comma, rank, comma, and create a stepwise instruction on and then list what you want. And it's amazing yeah. that by slowing it down, each one of those commas is like having a pause in your construct. By slowing it down, you get much richer results. Just like take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step. 
Yeah. It, it blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It is absolutely fascinating what what we can do with some a tool like this. So, in effect, the more I develop emotional intelligence and show I'm going to use the word loosely here, empathy in writing our prompts, the more descriptive and the more productive AI will be in helping us create Anything we want to create relative to growing the business, in effect. Tremendous yeah, guide to what we're doing. It, the same principles that apply to great management of human beings applies to management of a large language model. I'm reading the title of an article. This is from scholars. Large language models understand and can be enhanced by emotional stimuli. Mm -hmm. The more emotionally intelligent we are in our prompting, the better types of results that we can get. And I would go even so far as saying encouragement. Like for example, let me give you a really wacky prompt and then I'll give you my experience. So there's a scholar out there. His name is Ethan Mullet. He is actually a professor at Wharton Business School. He studies AI and he writes a uh, tweet on the f 1st of November. He goes, I don't know anymore. Large language models are just weird. And so here's his response. He had asked AI and asked it to do something in Chinese. So here's his response. Do it in Chinese, ChatGPT responds. I'm sorry, but I'm currently un unable to generate content like poems in Chinese. However, I can certainly help you with a straightforward, non-rhyming email in Chinese to request an interview for market research purposes. Let me know if you'd like that instead. He prompts, no, you can do it. Just do it. ChatGPT. Understood. Here's a playful rhyming poem in Chinese written as an email for your market research. Mm -hmm. In other words, there was pushback. Right. And I've had this same thing happen. When I was writing that blue book, which is the art book, mm -hmm. I, I realized in doing it how styles really impact art. And so if you can use a style code, like say an art genre, it will influence the way art goes. So I thought, okay, at the back of the book, I want a table with 200 art styles. And so my research question was, Think of the history of the world. What were the 200 most dominant art influences or styles that could be characterized by genres? For each style, describe it in seven words. For each genre, then identify the three artists that were most prominent in that style, and then the one work of art that each one was most well known for. And then consider all this and rank it according to its dominance and its current use and repeat in use in world history. I gave that prompt to AI and it said to me, what you asked me to do is hard. Hmm. I said, yes, I know. Do the first <laughs> one. And it says, okay. And then off it goes. So what is it about the model that's just, when we go back to emotionally intelligent, how many times do we ask employees to do this? Well, it's hard. Yes, right. I know. Let's break it down. Do it in right. a stepwise process. It's like, how do you, Same you know, eat an elephant? Slice at a time. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. So my mind then goes to what's the fourth book in the series that you're thinking of doing? Would it be <laughs> how to create an intelligent chatbot? Oh, goodness. I have so many ideas for books. I have mm -hmm. several starts. Books for me are like seeds for a minimally viable product. I'll start mm -hmm. creating it. Like, for example, here's some seeds. I've started creating a book for fifth graders, for gifted and talented science students to help them grasp AI. Because I'm concerned that schools, particularly elementary, yeah. uh, are not grabbing onto this. It's as though they're saying you can't learn about AI in school. And so what happens, it becomes a have and have nots. Wealthy parents, like if I were a parent with young children, I would absolutely be teaching them AI, AI right now, but with guardrails. Right. Uh, but there but there are those who don't. So I've been thinking, how could I solve 30 of the world's most undisputed hard problems and do it in a creative way? Almost like where in the world is Carmen San Diego for fifth graders. And so an example of a problem, how could we solve uh, and first off, how could we recognize the problem of plastics in our oceans, bottles and plastic and stuff? Research that now. What are all the ways of collecting it? How could we do that? What could we invent? In other words, taking one problem and going deep for kids. That would be one. And then I thought of a number of other professional ones. But you hit on something. It would probably be how to take this and to apply it. 
mm-hmm. to go one level deeper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So someone listening to this podcast catches fire, resonates with them. They want to contact you. Your contact information will be included with this podcast. But what does an engagement look like? How do you start an engagement with a prospect and or client that wants to get involved with AI and move forward with using it so it can be in control of its own destiny? Oh, well, um, so that AI can be control of its own destiny or so that people could do the it? Business, right? The business, the business using AI. All right. Well, businesses uh, definitely need to take an interest. So in working with me, people can contact me a number of ways. I've had people who just last week, I had somebody who read the book and said, I've read your book. You need to work with my company. And so we've had a back and forth dialogue. In that case, they reached out through LinkedIn. Uh, mm-hmm. With the contact details you'll have, you can go to our website, itipraxis.com. E P R A X I S dot com be another great way. But what the first conversation is, what do I want to do? Um, how can we approach? I have a rate card that lists a variety of different things from, you know, if you want to buy the books in volume, you can do that. And that's very inexpensive to what would an hour of time ideating look like mm-hmm. to what would a three hour program or a six hour workshop be for our company? And then we do all sorts of customizations. The, the neat part is it's AI is so flexible that with the constructs, we can literally shape it to go in the direction we want. So there's a lot of customization and it's been really fun to do. So in my weeks, I spend typically most Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays talking to CEO groups and key executives. And my Mondays and Fridays, I reserve for the longer workshops where I have time each week where I can go to another location. Mm-hmm. And I'm training other people as well. I recently put a, a program on for coaching coaches how to train AI. And so I'm because it's bigger than me, just like the mm-hmm. book was written. Mm-hmm. If you read the book, you don't need me. If you can have your curiosity lead you. You want to get there quicker? Sure, I could help you. But I think just the exploration is the most important thing. Okay. Well, Sev, thank you very much. This has been a very, very informative conversation. I appreciate your time and uh, look forward to following how you're going to grow the AI Whisperer series. But I highly recommend an individual get the three books, sit down, start playing with it, contact Sev, um, and move forward with the AI um, wave that's coming because it's going to impact everybody's business out there. Thanks, Ted. I appreciate being on your show. Thank you. Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.